I just can't stop smiling. Uh, I just soloed. Oh my <laughs> I've been dreaming about this day for about 20 years. Okay, hey. here we go. Student pilot's first solo is the first time they fly an airplane solo. Clever name, really. But it's a huge rite of passage. I would say that most pilots probably find their first solo even more memorable than the day they get their actual license. It's a little bit like a learner's permit when you're learning how to drive, except that they pretty much hand those out to anyone with a pulse. Typically what happens before first solo is you go out with your instructor and you do a few touch and go landings, which is a landing where you, you touch down, you land, and then you immediately take off again. And then they get out of the airplane and then you go and do a few more on your own while they watch. Many times, perhaps most of the time, that's part of the plan for the flight lesson, but on this day, that was not at all what I thought was going to happen. I didn't think I was going to be soloing that day, and I almost didn't fly that day, and I'm so glad that I did. I want to do some pattern work. I think it'd be good to do some hood work. It might be cool to do some pattern work at Rosemont. Sure. So that was my plan. That's not what we ended up doing. What I ended up doing was so much better, and it was completely unexpected. Not only did I not think I was going to solo that day, I was pretty much confident that I wasn't going to solo, and I was actually really discouraged, which is part of why I wasn't sure I was even going to fly that morning. And I'll explain why I was so confident that I wasn't going to solo, and why I was so discouraged later on, but I feel like now I've been talking too long, so let's go see some flying. <laughs> off doing touch and goes according to plan and I make a great first landing of the day and then another and then another all right you know what I do I like to hear full stop see that little smile I make right there that's because Justin just said, let's make this one a full stop. Full stop means you get off the runway and typically go back and park your airplane. So normally we do a bunch of touch and goes throughout the training session and then at the very end we do a full stop. However, we've only been flying for half an hour, so it's certainly too early to end the lesson. So when he said full stop, it wasn't because of the end of the lesson. It was so I could go drop him off and fly on my own. Up until this moment, I've always been, you know, it's surprising that I have no fear about soloing. <laughs> and and, and now it, it, it came. <laughs> uh, nervousness might be better than fear. Yeah, I'll be on the handheld radio. Pretty sure it works. Okay. No big deal, you know? All right. Just do the exact same thing, three landings. So I dropped him off, he hopped out, closed the door, and I was on my own. Clear prop! So I'm on my own, first order of business, completely forget how to start an airplane. Nope. I can only imagine how Justin feels, thinking, I just endorsed this guy to fly on his own, and he can't remember how to do the most Clear basic prop. things. Turns out I just forgot to turn on the master switch, I got it set up, the airplane started okay, and I was good to go. There is a rule in aviation that says that in the event that the pilot in command or any required crew member really, really, really wants a good video of any operation conducted under this part, it is the responsibility of the pilot in command to ensure that there is at least one audio or visual failure. I chose to comply to this rule by forgetting to plug in my audio cable. So I'll just kind of do my best to explain what's going on and we'll just work with what we've got. Unfortunately, you can't hear any of the audio while I'm taxing here, but I'm telling the story of the moment I decided to get my private pilot's license, which is also the moment I learned what a private pilot and a first solo even were. When I was about 12 or 13, my family took a long road trip somewhere. They decided to go and pick up some cassette tapes for us to listen to. One of them was a talk by a guy named John By the Way, entitled First Solo. John, by the way, is an author and youth speaker. He is also a private pilot. 
In this particular talk, he recounts his first solo flight. That was the first time that I learned that you could be a pilot even if it wasn't your career. That was the moment that I made the goal to become a pilot. Ever since that moment, I've been looking forward to this day, the day I took my first solo. I think that talk also describes pretty well the way I was feeling at this moment. I have tried to explain. Ever since I was as young as I can remember, I have wanted to fly airplanes, and now I am sitting in an airplane all alone with the engine running. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make is the first time I learned about a first solo, and the first time I decided, hey, I'm going to be a pilot even if it's not my career. I was like 12 or 13. I'm about to turn 33, meaning I have been dreaming about this day for about 20 years. Fun little tidbit. See that other plane flying up there? That's actually our flying club's other airplane. So it's kind of cool that we were both in the pattern at the same time for my first solo. Lights, camera, action, smiles for sure on. On traffic jerk. Papa is taking runway 24. And to anticipate the airplane got to a little lighter. People have asked me, like, what exactly were you feeling right at that moment when you took off solo for the first time? And honestly, I mostly just remember thinking, you know, stay aligned with the runway, keep your airspeed at 80 miles per hour, you know, the stuff, the same things that I think every time I take off. Um, I was just focused on flying the airplane and couldn't really worry about it being my first solo. But then once I was a little more established and flying, that's when I started you know, really thinking about, oh shoot, I'm flying this on my own. And there's definitely a little bit of you that thinks, okay, I can either land this plane or I can crash this plane. But here's hoping I choose the landing option. Not really much your instructor can do from the ground. So there's a little bit of that nervousness, but also I have landed this plane quite a few times before and I felt pretty confident that I would land it safely. I think what I was more concerned about is will I land it well. There's a little bit of pressure that I put on myself because I've been looking forward to this day so long and I just really wanted it to be good. I was a little nervous, you know, what if, what if it's a bad landing and I'm not proud of it at the end? In the end, all you can do is fly the way you trained and uh, hope it turns out well. I'm actually flying before the control tower opened, so my radio calls here are really just made to any other traffic in the area, including the other club airplane that's flying the pattern with me. So the whole time we're, we're all kind of notifying each other of where our position is. So my radio call here would be something like you know, Fox Traffic, Cherokee Niner through Ski Papas on right base for runway 24, touch and go, Fox Traffic.
And then here I'd be saying Fox Traffic, Cherokee Niner, Three Whiskey Papa, and on final, Runway 2 4, Touch and Go, Fox Traffic. And that just gives the other guy flying around an idea of where I am so he knows where to look out. You see that look of shock on my face? That's because I could not believe how good that landing was. At the time that I'm finally editing this, I already have my pilot certificate and about 70 hours, and that's still one of the best landings I've ever had. Oh my goodness, I think that was my best landing yet. <laughs> I did it on my own. After that first landing, the rest of the flight was completely different. I wasn't worried at all about my performance, I was just having a great time and couldn't believe how fortunate I was. On that turn to crosswind after my first touch and go, I distinctly remember my eyes actually tearing up a bit. All my hard work had paid off, and this was just exactly what I had wanted for years, and I just couldn't believe how fortunate I was. If you've watched this much of my video, you must at least like it a little bit. Either that or you fell asleep. So if you like it, why not let me know by clicking that little button down there. I'm hoping that this video is going to help inspire more people who are striving to solo in an airplane and clicking that like button helps us reach a wider audience. Or if you did get this far because you did fall asleep, um, have a great nap. You deserve it, and if this video helped you fall asleep, go ahead and like it when you wake up. Though I guess if you're asleep, you wouldn't really hear that part. Maybe the subliminal messages work. Like, subscribe. Here I'm on downwind, right across from the runway numbers. We call this the a beam point, and that's when I reduce power, I lower the first notch of flaps, and I begin a three to 500 feet per minute descent. You can see that I'm looking around quite a lot here. That's because the other plane in the traffic pattern, my flying club's RV-12, is going a little faster than me, so, and he's starting to kind of catch up a little bit. That's not like a huge concern though, it just means that I have to keep an eye on him and make sure I make good radio calls so that we each know where the other person is. So at this point I'm on base, so I lower the second notch of flaps and I reduce speed to around 80 miles an hour. And this is the base to final turn, which is one of the more difficult parts. It's a little like when you're learning to park a car, it takes some practice to get the judgment right, to know exactly when to start turning and how sharp to turn so that you're lined up with the parking spot. It's also the most dangerous part because if you overshoot it, you might be tempted to correct with a bunch of rudder because for some reason pilots are afraid to bank too much when they're low to the ground. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the science and aero of it, but basically too much rudder with not enough aileron at a slow speed is a formula for a stall spin accident, which is basically unrecoverable this close to the ground. Nothing to be scared about, it's just you need to remember not to keep it too slow and keep your rudder and ailerons coordinated. And if things don't look good, you can always just add power and go around the pattern again. And then on final, my main focus is just staying aligned with the runway, keeping my angle of descent pointed at those two white bars. And and then just keeping my airspeed at about 70 miles an hour. Once I'm just a few feet above the runway, I pull back a little bit to bleed off a little airspeed, and then the airplane touches down. Then it's flaps up, carburetor heat off, and full throttle to go around for one more lap. By the way, as I'm making this commentary, it's important to mention that this video is not in any way intended to be flight instruction. I'm just commenting on what I'm doing in order to give people the idea of the sorts of things that a pilot or student pilot does while flying an airplane. I'm not a flight instructor, and any students watching this should use the airspeeds and procedures that their flight instructor recommends and not mine. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I'd been pretty discouraged, I was confident that I wouldn't solo, and I wasn't even planning on flying that day. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, this flight was on a Friday, but the day before I had a flight lesson as well. 
And on that Thursday flight, I had really been hoping to solo because I thought I was going to be ready and because the following two weeks I wouldn't have much time to fly and I really wanted to get the solo in before I went on that two week break of little to no flying. Because the next week I had this family reunion and then as soon as we got home my wife was going to have to leave to help out at a church camp which meant I'd be watching the kids. And then after that there was something else which honestly I can't even remember anymore. So I sort of had this now or never mentality on Thursday, but as I was flying, I guess my instructor just didn't think I was quite ready. When we debriefed at the end of the lesson, he just said we'd keep working on it and hopefully I'd be soloing in another two or three lessons. Well, since I was going to basically be taking two weeks off, that meant I'd be forgetting stuff. I'd probably need more than two or three lessons, so soloing could be like a month away, which just seemed like an eternity, and honestly, I felt pretty devastated. Well, maybe Justin knew there was a chance I'd be ready the next day, because he mentioned to me a few times that he'd be available to do a Friday flight with me, but I was pretty hesitant because the time commitment of my flight lessons were really taking a toll on my family, and flying Friday would be the first time I had flight lessons two days in a row, and it would also be the first time I flew three times in one week, and I didn't want to do that to my family, plus I was just discouraged, and I didn't see much of a point in cramming in one more lesson before we took our trip. But ultimately, I decided to consider it, so I sent my wife a text message that said, basically, you know, my love, my life, my everything. I know this has been so hard on you, and I hate to put more on your plate, but flying tomorrow could be really important to my training's progression. Would it be okay with you if I went flying tomorrow morning? And she replied, My dearest husband, it is a burden taking care of these kids while you're away, but I want you to be able to follow your dreams. But in all seriousness, I'll be forever grateful to my beautiful bride for letting me fly that day. We're both really busy people, and the time I spent flight training that week really was hard on her and our kids. But by allowing me to fly that day, she literally made my dreams come true. If I hadn't flown that day, it may have set me back a month and probably a few hundred dollars. I'm really grateful for her sacrifice on this day and throughout all of my training. It's really not fair to her that I get to do any of this, but she knows I'm passionate about it and she's let me pursue it and I don't think I'll ever be able to thank her enough for that. So here I'm turning final on the last of my three solo landings and I just remember not wanting it to end. I definitely found myself thinking, you know, what would happen if I decided to just do another touch and go and just keep flying. But fortunately I did have a sense to obey my instructor and I ended the flight with my third landing. All right. What'd you think, man? I, I, I was just smiling the whole time. Nice. That was See, awesome. when you're ready, it's a non-event, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an event, but yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> non-event in terms of like being uh, scary. Right. Yeah. Cool, man. What do you want to do next? So after that, we still had a little bit of time left, so we decided to do a couple victory laps around Rosemond, which is where I live, so it's kind of fun because I could tell my wife and kids to go stand in the backyard and look for me. Yeah, nicely done, man. Thanks. My my first landing actually felt like one of my best. Nice. Um, so I was I was happy, and after that, I was like, oh yeah, I've got this. <laughs> but, yeah, you go through phases where you're like, yeah, I got this, and then you're like, <laughs> and yeah, like I don't man. know how to do this. <laughs> like, what, what's going on? <laughs> Why did I think I knew how to fly an airplane? Right, exactly. Flying to Rosemont was pretty interesting because it's a much smaller runway than I'm used to and it was cool because it's, you know, right by my house, but I think we're going to save the details of that for another video. So not everyone does this, but a common tradition is that after your first solo, your instructor cuts off your shirt tail and you keep it as a souvenir. I had been careful for the last several lessons to make sure I was always wearing a shirt that I liked enough to keep forever, but that I didn't like so much that I didn't want to cut. Justin cut off way more of my shirt than I expected. The funny part is that I guess I never really mentioned this tradition to my wife, so when I came home and I was wearing like this really, really ripped up shirt, she was pretty horrified. I think she thought I was in some sort of accident or something to get my shirt messed up so badly. But after I explained it to her, I guess she really understood the significance of it because she even got my shirt framed for me in this, this nice frame with a little plaque and everything, so that was really cool of her. My wife's the best, really. I don't really know how I uh, managed to luck out there. And then after that, I just 
texted everyone who I could think of fishing for congratulations and uh, just was smiling the rest of the day and I was looking forward to flying solo again.